you know, what exactly is information? What are terms such, you know, terms such as rationality and intelligence? Um, what exactly do these things mean? Okay, these are some of the technical concepts that will become very important for the, for some of the later discussions. So we need to kind of build, um, kind of bi build some building blocks there. The next week we'll talk about modernity and acceleration. Basically, modernity, uh, you know, what is called, the, you know, the modern period or modernity, um, is basically characterized by several massive uh, technological, economic speed ups, if you will, or accelerations. Um, and one of the one of the that will be sort of one of the key kind of backdrops to all the stuff that we're talking about today, uh, because I think that ba basically it's one of my hypotheses that, um, you know. The, the, the technological and economic accelerations that took off at the beginning of the modern period, they're actually way more uh, vertiginous. They're way more stupefying and, and, and confusing than most of us have, have even begun to realize. And in some sense, we're still, we're still trying to grapple with uh, the, the, the almost catastrophic rate of change that ignited very rapidly in you know around beginning in around the 1500s sounds like a long time ago but it's not it's it, you know in historical time it's like yesterday and the changes that have uh, the, the changes that characterize modern society today um have all happened in a, in a, in a kind of uh, in a kind of historical blink um so that's one of and so the re this is obviously the reason this is connected to media obviously is because we now live in a kind of uh ridiculously mass mediated society um and the point is to see this in a, in a larger, longer historical context. Then we'll talk about ideology, democracy, and capitalism, um, sort of, you know, uh, the rise of, uh, of kind of liberal democracies in the early 20th, end of the 19th century, early 20th century, sort of the, the first rise of mass media, you know, as we think of it, you know, things like radio uh, and newspapers really kind of playing a crucial role in basically our current sense of what a liberal democratic state is. Um, so we'll talk about that kind of moment and, you know, what exactly is the concept of democracy? Uh, I'll, I'll suggest to you that it's actually, uh, it's, a, it's actually quite a dubious concept. Uh, it's, there's reason to believe that, you know, democracy is sort of a, it's a euphemism or a piece of ideology in some sense um, that arose with kind of modern capitalism uh, in some sense as a kind of cover for uh for capitalism. It's not at all a clear cut story, but we're gonna to try to figure that out. And basically the argument I make in that session is that um, precisely in the early 20th century, um, democracy is kind of launched as an ideological weapon in some sense by the Western states uh, as a kind of cover for, for capitalism and, and its problems. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I have some evidence for that. I have a kind of story that I tell about that. Um, then we'll talk about the information revolution, which um, is basically a set of discoveries um, that were made that was made in the uh, middle of the 20th century. Let's just say we'll talk a little bit more about the specific dates, but basically, you know, every, our, our, all of the kind of technological uh, accelerations that define our current, uh, you know, period today in our own lives—the internet, TV, right, all of these things—these um, were all made possible by a, a, a relatively small number of uh, scientific discoveries, actually, in, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and we're gonna try to understand, I'm gonna try to sh explain to you what the hell happened, what exactly were those discoveries. Uh, and, but most importantly, what were the political implications of those discoveries? Um, okay, so then we'll go into the early science of the media. So basically, the first, you know, significant modern efforts to really, uh, you know, in a scientifically rigorous way, uh, think about uh, the role of modern media in modern societies at the t around the time of the information revolution, right? So some of you might have heard of things like cybernetics, which is a kind of uh, uh, fancy sounding word for one of the early efforts to really think about, you know, the science of information as it applies to uh, societies. You know, the idea of cybernetics, which we'll talk much more about later, is that, you know, all machines and biological organisms and social systems can all be described with one basic scientific language called cybernetics. Um, and so it has, you know, it's, it's, it's very fascinating and it was, it was 
it was a kind of weird and exciting kind of moment in in uh, mid 20th century social science. And in a, a lot of ways, it kind of lost favor um, and was replaced by other kind of uh, tendencies in academic social science. So nowadays, no one talks about cybernetics and social in academic social science. Uh, it fell out of the repute. But as we as we do now today, talk more and more about things like artificial intelligence. Uh, it's going to become, you know, cybernetics has a kind of new appeal, I think, and it's at least worth understanding, okay? Because basically, you know, um, artificial intelligence, basically anything that kind of is intelligent enough to uh, to be recursive, you know, to, to kind of uh, to receive feedbacks, is basically kind of in the uh, in the realm of cybernetics, okay? And that and that's basically what artificial intelligence entails. So we'll try to grab a grasp on all of those things. In the second session, we'll go back to this idea of the information revolution, um, but we'll specifically try to look at the uh, political implications. So um, my hypothesis here, and by the way, if it's not clear, folks, uh, I'm going to go on a little aside real quick. Then we'll step back to week seven. So aside begins now. Uh, a lot of some modules are like textbook modules, right? Like some are very um, straightforward, hard nosed. There's a textbook. You're being taught, you know, what... Uh, people have been taught in that field for ages. Uh, and that's totally good. Like from my pair 1005, for instance, in my introduction of research methods, uh, for those of you who were in it, um, that's a very, that's a relatively straight laced uh, module. It's like how to think like a social scientist. There's, there are certain rules. There's a certain catechism. Uh, very straightforward. And I was trying to give you a kind of textbook um, understanding of a, a particular kind of training, right? But there are other kinds of modules um, and, and, especially optional modules are an opportunity for lecturers to basically kind of go more out on a limb um, and share with you maybe not what is currently known by everyone, but actually what is at the edge of their own thinking. Okay. And so I, you know, I use this module to do that. So for those of you who know me for 1005, some of the stuff that I talk about in this module might be really confusing because, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty hard nosed social scientist. I'm an empiricist. I, you know, I use quantitative methods and statistics, and I'm, I very much believe in the scientific method and being really close to the data. But on the other hand, there are lots of things that we can't study with data. There are a lot of things that we can't test with experiments. There are a lot of things that we can't know for sure, uh, but we can still think about it, and it's important to do that. And I'm, you know, I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm always reading, I'm always trying to solve new puzzles. I'm always trying to figure out things about the world. So what I do in this module is I share with you, um, the very edges of what I currently think, the very edges of what I, what seems to me to be the case and what I'll try to figure out more significantly and more compellingly in the future. But right now, um, for, for module, for the module, I'm just basically going to lay out what things look like in a kind of, in the most kind of hopefully interesting, stimulating. And, you know, it, uh, I, I think a lot of what I'm going to share with you is well grounded. Obviously I'm going to give you, you know, I'm, I'm I'm going to give you a well-grounded um, base of, of content, but a lot of the a lot of the stuff that we talk about will be literally uh, me kind of trying to figure things out with you. Okay, so I, I should make that clear, right? It'll be clear in the way that I say things. If I call something a hypothesis, or here's what I think, or you know, you'll be I'll, I'll be I'm, I'm pretty good at being clear about like what is known very well and well documented and, and consensus and what you know I think or what I'm trying to figure out. Okay, aside. Over, return to uh, the second session on the information revolution. The reason I just said all that is because this is kind of my focus, the focus of my kind of, not just my thinking, but my academic research right now. I'm really interested in the effects of what happened from the, politi from the information revolution. Because basically, in the, in the 70s, like, things go really weird in, in a lot of ways. Like in the advanced liberal democracies like the UK or the US, a bunch of stuff starts going haywire around the 70s. And I think that the information revolution has something to do with it because the information revolution really was this kind of massive society-wide transformation of you know our human capacity to process information. It basically, it, 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 it ballooned, it skyrocketed um, from you know the 1950s onward leading to things like the internet. And I really, it really does just seem to me that basically it was such a massive shock um, that we, we barely understand what happened, like psychologically uh, or in our own experience, because we're, we're, sl we're slow, you know, we're not able to understand like super complicated things, especially when they happen at a massive society level um, in a rapid way. Okay, so 
But I do know that in the 70s, a bunch of things go crazy. Like, I, so obviously the rise of inequality that now is everyone talks about, you know, that really picks up, uh, you know, at the end, at, at the end of the 70s, and the 80s. Um, but things like cable television start getting developed. Um, and cable television was a significant change to kind of pre-cable television because cable television was the beginning of people being able to choose different television channels, right? Things like um, uh, different types of, of physical technology, like transportation technology, also picks up like crazy um, our ability to basically uh, move around more efficiently, more rapidly. That takes off. Um, ideological sorting, so people on the left uh, more and more choosing to only hang out with people on the left and people on the right choosing more and more to only hang out with people on the right. That really kicks off, I think, in, in, in around the, the, you know, the early 80s. Um, if I recall correctly, we'll be looking more into that. Basically, a bunch of things uh, start to go screwy all around um, the same time, roughly, with, you know, in, in historical time, it's like very close together. There might be a matter of several years apart from these, these different types of, of trends that, that ignite. But basically, that's why I'm very fascinated. I'm very fascinated by the 70s in particular um, and everything that happens from the 80s onward. And I have some hypotheses about how I think, you know, uh, the information revolution has, to, has something to do with it. Because basically, what the information revolution represents was uh, a significant kind of increase in our capacity to, like, what happens when, when all of a sudden our ability to manipulate information becomes way more powerful? Well, we're going to talk about that, but to foreshadow, um, one thing is that perhaps the, the people with greater skills in manipulating information become multiplicatively even more powerful, whereas people with, who don't have skills in manipulating information, they become even significantly more you know, uh, marginalized or poor or, or, or dejected. Um, things like that. Uh, it becomes harder, I think, for governments to uh, control capitalism because as information processing power increases, you know, if you're a super smart, ambitious capitalist entrepreneur, you can just be way more clever, way more quickly, and make things happen in ways that normal people, such as government bureaucrats, like literally can't even follow, right? So I think that what happens basically with the information revolution is, as information processing power increases, all of these social fissures start to occur, and it and it and it fundamentally transforms modern politics in massive ways that I can't fully prove to you because this is just a hypothesis. Um, but we do know for sure that over the past several decades, lots of stuff is, is, is going haywire uh, in modern liberal democracies, leading to things like Brexit and Trump, right? So it kind of makes sense to me that in today's world where so many things are going haywire and all the experts are kind of uh, pretty confused, that it makes sense to me to look for maybe some big thing that happened that perhaps had some effect on all of these little fissures and, and, and problematic trends and dynamics. Uh, and I, it's my wager that I think the information revolution had something to do with it. Okay. So that's going to be, that's going to be one of the major kind of overarching, um, themes, uh, of the module. Okay. All right. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about psychology and ideology. Um, and you know, the reason we, we need to talk about psychology and ideology is because, uh, a lot of people think of you know the concept of ideology, you know the, the old school kind of Marxist concept of ideology, as like you know the set of the set of beliefs that the ruling class wants you to think. Um, that's kind of the, the cartoon image many people have in their mind of, of what ideology is. Um, and a lot of people think that you know the media uh, supplies this like uh, supply of images and notions. That like brainwashes us all into uh, supporting the system. You know, that's kind of like the cartoonish, but but basic kind of uh, Marxist idea that a lot of people have in their heads. Um, and I, there may be there might be some truth to that, but but the reality is, media researchers have actually had a really hard time finding solid evidence of like direct propaganda effects. It's actually really hard to brainwash someone. You know, people have tried. And they tried to study it. Um, it's actually really hard to do it, and it's really hard to find evidence of it. Um, but there are other ways in which our own psychology, our own brains, play massive tricks on us. And in particular, our social psychology um, 
like what we actually do when we think about politics and we express to our friends or you know to people in a public forum what we think about politics the actual psychological process of what you're doing there you don't know what that is it's it's not clear to you and i don't mean you because you're stupid i mean human beings like human beings think they're doing one thing but psychology actually shows us that they're that we systematically have tendencies to do things that are not at all what we think we're doing. So a, a good example of this is, and this will be kind of one of the themes we talk about um, in, that, in that session, is basically the, the idea of uh, motivated reasoning. I'm not sure if any of you have come across that idea, but you know, we all think, what most human beings think, right, is that we have brains, we look out at the world, we analyze it, we make our judgments about what kinds of politics we think are good, what kinds of politics we think are bad, and then you know when we have politic, political conversations with people or we, we have to choose to vote or whatever, um, or we have to interpret the news to make judgments about if a politician is good or bad, most people think that what we're doing is we're, we use our brains, we, we analyze the situation, and we come to a judgment about what seems to be the rational decision. Uh, and the reality of how people's brains actually work, the way that human beings actually function, is not that at all. Um, and what the basic insight to just kind of foreshadow, we'll go into what this means later, but to foreshadow the basic insight that emerges from moral psychology is that intuitions, and in particular moral intuitions, uh, come first. So we don't actually think, like we, we don't use our judgment to survey all the information and make the best possible rational judgment. We just, we do not do that. The main reason being that it takes too much time. It's really difficult to do that. Um, so for the most part, what people are actually doing when they talk about politics is they get a gut feeling. Uh, that's going to sound bad on the audio. They get a gut feeling of what they feel about a certain topic or a certain person. And then their brain goes searching for a rationalization that can justify their gut feeling. And we have remarkably uh, almost like – it's like mind-bogglingly interesting uh, and convincing – evidence that this is actually what people do. Like, did you know that basically like um, your body knows how it feels about something before it even knows what that thing is fully? Like literally they have, they have been able to measure like the actual processes of perception, the, the, the physiological processes and the parts of your system that are engaged in basically emotional response, they trigger first, they trigger faster. And they operate on the rest of your body faster than your than your than your rational judgment even can, and so no matter how smart and rational and reflective you think you are, um, most of the time when you're thinking about politics, your brain is actually following a master that you're not even really aware of. Okay, so ideology is real, I think, in the sense of in the sense that you know there are ideas and there are kind of intellectual processes that human beings follow that keep them confused and kind of pacified and uh, that, that ultimately serve the interests of kind of, you know, the ruling elite or whatever you want to call it. Like there are, there are actually intellectual issues with, there are intellectual processes in which most people are not able to be as powerful as they could be. They're not able to think as clearly as they could think. They're not able to, to say and do um, what they are potentially capable of, but it's not because the ruling class is feeding you like, uh, ideas that serve their interests and brainwashing you through the media. That's not, that's just not really what's happening. I don't think it's, 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 it's at a different level. In other words, um, it's, it's at a kind of psychological level, um, that deep ideological, uh, divisions occur. And basically this is the explanation for why some people lean to the left and some people lean to the right. Um, there's a, there's a theory that basically, uh, left and people on the left and right have different kind of psychological traits, uh, certain, uh, kind of emotional, Leanings that are more or less, that are mu much of it is actually inherited. Much of it is actually genetic. Um, not all of it, but much of it. And then we just we use our brain to come up with intellectual stuff that flatters those inherited feelings. Basically, okay. There's a lot. There's a surprising amount of evidence for that. Okay. So I'm more interested in the ideology of how these things function without us knowing, and how that leads. I think and this is where my thinking goes off on on a limb here. Uh, I think that actually these um, these ways that our minds and our bodies function that we don't fully understand that most people like just don't fully understand 
they're actually they keep us down in a political way like they really um they limit what we're able to do individually but also with each other um and i have and basically one of my kind of guiding hypotheses my personal kind of i don't know a, a belief i guess you could call it or whatever is that um if we can all figure out these processes and how they actually work we can kind of un, you know we can learn how we're actually wired you know to use a kind of mediatic or media uh metaphor how we're wired um that that's actually the the key discoveries that we need to make as human beings to figure out how to fundamentally transform our society in in, in the direction of you know in a more positive direction that all of us you know could in, in which all of us could find you know our radical kind of collective flourishing um so yeah okay so that's what we'll talk about there um and then, so actually that's a perfect segue. I didn't even mean to do it, but it's a perfect segue into the last two sessions where I will um, talk about uh, these sort of pathways out of the current kind of predicament that I think human beings are in. I mean, I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's like what I'm thinking, that's what I'm thinking about. And that's what I, I think that's what we should all be tackling, right? You know, we should all, like, why not aim for like the biggest possible questions? For your research essays and for your dissertation, you know, you have to be disciplined and you have to ask a question that that you can answer and you have to provide a logical, disciplined answer. So that's good. And you have to be conscientious. You have to be disciplined in your work. Um, but in the in a lecture, in a, in a class, in seminars, we're, we can think whatever we want. You know, you thinking is is a totally different process than, uh, you know, writing a formal piece of work. Um, and it's in these last two sections in particular that I will uh, really kind of go uh, uh, pretty far out in trying to share with you uh, what I think based on everything that we've learned. I mean, in the first several sessions, basically what I'm gonna be doing is kind of painting a picture for you of uh, how I think technology and information and communication has played a, a bunch of significant roles in basically fucking up our society. and. Uh, putting us in positions where we suffer tremendously and where we're confused tremendously and where we don't understand each other and we're actively, because we don't understand fully the kind of technological processes in which we are embedded, we are actively, without our knowing it, kind of messing ourselves up even. We're actively messing ourselves up and we're messing each other up and we're actively kind of uh, seeking solutions that are not, that we don't even necessarily want if we could unwind how we've been kind of pacified by these confusing uh, kind of technological uh, tendencies in some sense. That, that's, that's one way to kind of summarize uh, an overarching perspective that I'm going to be trying to build for you over you know, the first several weeks. And then the last two sessions will be uh, what I think are the most promising pathways out of it. So it's like, you know, look, and, and I should say, this is a good place to say that um, one of the things that we are going to be going over a lot or, or encountering a lot in this module is um, uh, questions of 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 political ideology, like left versus right, you know, the main sort of dimension of political ideology. Like, what do those things even mean today anymore? I mean, I'm honestly so uh, perplexed by that, and I'm so fascinated by that, um, because I think that in a lot of ways, like what even what the left even means and what the right even means, it's being scrambled. I think in profound ways, um, you know. So even like someone like Donald Trump, right? Like he's in some obvious ways culturally. He's on the right, but if you actually look at all the things he says and is trying to do and uh, his policies, like some of them are not even right wing. Like some of his economic ideas are weirdly left wing. Um, and so what does that mean? How, how, like, why is that going on? How do we process that? Other things like, I don't know if you know this, but it's important for you to, to realize like um, <coughs> in, this, in, the, in academia, and especially in the social sciences and, and especially in the humanities, um, you know that well let me ask you this um what do you think is the ideological balance among your professors left versus right so um in other words i'm asking what is your estimate of let's not be personal about it, uh but we'll say like your, your sense of academic professors in uh you know actually okay yeah let's do the politics department why not it's fun uh we have a shared we have a shared reference I don't have like precise data on what every single person thinks, but I do have data on the larger field so we can make reasonable extrapolations. And I know people personally, so we can make reasonable extrapolations. We're not gonna talk about anyone in particular, 
but based on your experience in the politics department and the different lecturers you've had and people you've seen or whatever, um, what is your estimate of the, the percentage of our faculty? We have like 21 lecturers. What is your estimate of the percentage of them that are uh, right wingers or like center to right? Center or like leaning, you know, anywhere from right of center. What percentage do you think? All right, you know, you know, it doesn't require a big like deliberation, but it's interesting. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting that you all kind of like started talking. Should I take that as a signal that you find that very fascinating? And you're kind of like a. So, uh, why don't a few people just shout out? What's your answer? Ten percent. What else? Twenty. What else? Thirty. What else? Keep keep going, everyone. Zero. Okay. Uh, anyone want to? Anyone want to highball it? You think that's right? Okay. But I would say as a, as an overarching distribution, it's pretty good. Your senses are pretty good. Um, yes. Uh, I obviously I don't know what everyone in my department thinks, and even if I did, I would not out them. Um, <laughs> because uh, it's none of your business what people think in their private lives. Uh, but from what we know about the re people have done research on like the ideological dispositions of, um, of different disciplines. Um, and it's basically fair to say that in most departments such as ours, like a, a kind of, you know, a, a, a not super scientific, um, kind of broad based, so a lot of people do theory in, in the humanities in our department. A few of us are more kind of scientific in our in our methodologies, um, but put it this way, I would say um, to estimate ten percent right leaners in our department would probably be my guess is that that would be actually generous, um, it, based on the research that we know. You know, in fields such as mine, you know, it's usually it's, it's like usually a, like ten percent or less um, are conservatives. The basic point, be, and different surveys kind of have different outcomes, um, but basically the more kind of humanistic you get, the more lefty the faculty becomes. And in the more hard-nosed sciences, it's a little bit less you know, ideologically um, <coughs> homogenous. But basically, folks, what I'm getting at is um, the, the kind of academic culture today, like humanistic academic culture today, is has a kind of overwhelmingly lefty kind of tendency okay and that's not that's not it's not always been like that and that's that's the fascinating question i'm not making any kind of um judgment or, or statement about that but it's a relatively new thing and in particular it's in the 90s that this really takes off um that this uh, each year um the the academia becomes kind of more and more lefty okay so why is that i mean i don't know i don't i really i mean i have a few kind of guesses but i i think it has something to do with these other with these other trends that, that we're talking about. Um, and it's, you know, I don't, it's re you really need to be careful to not try to develop like a unified theory of everything uh, with like one particular pet idea that you have, right? So I'm interested in information technology. Uh, I can't go around and try, you know, try to explain every single thing in the world today as a kind of result of the information revolution or something like that. So that's something I'm very on guard to not do. Um, but sorting, is something that we are seeing across society, right? So like people are ideologically sorting even within their own like marriages and stuff like that, right? Like today, uh, political ideology is a more significant predictor of who you're gonna marry than it was um, like 50 years ago, significantly. Um, people are selecting on these types of criteria more and more. And my, my, the, my hypothesis basically is that there's something about information technology that basically it empowers you to select more efficiently, more rapidly, more easily. Um, that, that is kind of what information processing is, the, the manipulation of information is, right? And so something really screwy is going on over the past few decades to academia. And, it's a, and it affects you know, the, the experience that you're having. It's, it affects the world that you're embedded in. And you need to know these sorts of changes and these dynamics 